Good morning. And it is a good morning. But, oh, there's always the but, isn't there? Yeah. Telling people what you really think. I, I love this. Telling your stakeholders what you really think. And somebody already commented, um, the boss is still the boss. Yeah, the boss is still the boss. But even your boss as a stakeholder needs to know what you really think. Needs to know what you really think. This doesn't mean I'm going to recommend going in going, are you out of your flipping mind? No, no, not at all. In fact, what I'm going to emphasize and what I, th what I think we really need to stress is how you message is everything. How you share messages, everything. And so my objective today is to give you ways to do exactly what we're doing, where you walk away with these specific outcomes. Now think about this. We're supposed to wrap up before 11 o'clock or before noontime Eastern. So that's 55 minutes from now. And that means I'm supposed to leave about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Wow, we don't have a lot of time to get all these things done. But notice where we're going. How many meetings do you go into and you're sitting around at the meeting going, I have no idea why I'm here. Yeah, we, we wind up, there. or virtually you'll log on, you'll be good to go, and then you'll just kind of settle things down. You'll actually just uh, go ahead and Okay, I am logged on, so I have now officially attended the meeting. The meeting has barely begun, and you're like, I've attended. I'm good. And you're thinking you're getting away with murder until somebody says, so, Mary, what do you think? Ah! Yeah, panic sets in. Panic does. It sets in. And you're like, oh, crap. I, I, uh, gee, could you, could you repeat the question, please? You know, that, that's a big deal. We need to be the ones who actively know precisely what's going to be happening at the meetings. And we should be the ones who are telling people, you know, after we have this conversation, I've been following on, uh, on one of my many social media websites. Uh, I've been following one group that's been sharing elevator speeches. Got to tell you, I'm not a big fan of elevator speeches. Because that's more like, what do you say when you have someone imprisoned? Yeah, that's not a, not a good plan. But uh, if you can give people clarity on these things, you win. You do. That is the elevator speech. But notice what I've just told you. Where we're going. I'm telling you precisely where we're going. There's no surprise here. This is not a mystery to be revealed. No, it's just where we're going. It's exactly where we're going, and that's precisely what we're going to be doing. My background, by the way, many of you are aware that prior to getting into project management some, wow, 40 years ago, 40 years ago, no, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, for the decade prior to that, I was a member of <clears throat> the media. Yeah. And here, I'll, I'll, I'll legitimize myself. Hold on. Let me... This thing right here. I always keep it by my desk because it's like one of the coolest mementos from past careers. That was my congressional press pass. Yeah. I actually worked in Washington, D.C. as a member of the media. Uh, I'm so ashamed. Anyhow. The whole idea is I was a journalist by trade. And one of the first things they teach you in J101, Journalism 101, is the inverted pyramid. Now, you should know what the inverted pyramid is. It is the headline, then the subhead, which is, here's what we're here about, and here's a significant chunk of detail, and then less detail. Finer detail, finer, 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 all the way down. When you when you speak to somebody that way, when you share messages that way, people appreciate it because at any given point in time, when you notice them starting to chase shiny objects, and you've seen that happen, people drift. 
and they're looking elsewhere and they're kind of tuned out. It's time to stop. And if you use the inverted pyramid, if you did it with the headline, the subhead and the major details in that order, you can cut that off at any time. The inverted pyramid was created for newspapers so that the editors could be brainless. They could. All they had to do was take a pair of scissors, literal scissors, and just they'd have an article and it'd be this column width. And they'd go down the article and they could hit the end of any paragraph, take the scissors and go snip and still have a complete story up above. Ah, kind of a neat thing and a great way to write. Because if you do that, you're going to share the message very well. Some of you um, may have heard I've, I've run into some, some health issues. And it goes to, I, I now have a whole fleet of oncologists. Yeah, I have a whole cadre of oncologists working for me, and it's, it's kind of cool. But the first time I, I came in after all the myriad tests they run on you, and I met with Dr. Hudhud. That's really the guy's name. I met with Dr. Hudhud and went into his office with my wife. And he said, I'm not going to mince words with you, Carl. You have incurable liver cancer. Boom. There's the ton of bricks. There's the, oh, wow. You know, didn't mention incurable. Could mean I'd last another 20 years. You know, didn't, didn't go down that road. No. Just started with the headline. But you know what? Dr. Hudhud did me a valuable service in that moment. It was not a message I wanted to hear. It was not something I really cared about at that point. And it was like, well, crap, the word incurable just sounds like, and then you die. You know, and, and not attractive, but he shared the message effectively. It was something I didn't want to hear. It was something I'm sure he's told a dozen other patients. But at the same time, he got the bad news right out of the way. You know, even if they don't want to hear the message, peeling off that Band-Aid right at the beginning, smart move, very smart, because what it does is it clarifies, this is why we're here. Everything from this point is within that prism. Everything there is through that filter, and it all matters. Now, one of my other doctors, Dr. Mavramatis, um, and and I, like I said, I've got a whole fleet of them. If I had listed them all, we'd be here all day. Dr. Mavramatis explained it to me. She said, I said, why do I need you? And she said, my job is to delay your cancer. Now, I think you've already been told it's incurable. My job is to delay it. Again, right up front, boom. Here's my job, plain, simple terms. And that was a message I wanted to hear. That was a really good message. We want to get people to start with the inverted pyramid. Just go ahead and tell them why they're there. That way, if they, have to, if they challenge the headline, you've got a problem from the beginning. If they accept the headline, the rest of your message is now going to be processed through the right filter. It's going to be shared through the right filter. Since I'm not out on the streets much, one of the things I find interesting is watching the occasional Karen video or Ken video. Dane Cook, by the way, is the person you can blame for referring to somebody as a Karen. And if there are any Karens on the call, I am so sorry. Because Dane Cook ruined your life. He really did. Karens, for those of you who have not run into that particular term, Karens are these people, they're the ones who use classic phrases like, do you know who I am? Or, I don't think you understand the rules. Oh my gosh, take a pill. Yeah, these are people who scream the message and make it all centered on them. They don't care if you have the plague. They'll be like, yeah, but your car is in my driveway. Yes, and I'm dying of the plague in the street. And it doesn't matter. Your car is blocking my driveway. You don't need to share it like Karens or Kens. 
You really don't. If you're going to share messages, think about what do they need to hear? What filter are you going to apply for the rest of the conversation? How do I want them to understand this? Is it about this or that? And the moment you catch yourself thinking, you know, I don't think they get me, back off. Because quite frankly, they probably get the, the message you're sharing is something that it's not being sold well. It's not being told well. I collect metal signs. This is one of my hobbies. I have a lot of really weirdo hobbies, but I collect antique metal signs. And I picked this one up in an auction and I, and I had to laugh because it's, it's, it's to me, it's like an oxymoron sign. Budweiser drive-in. It, it's a drive-in liquor store. And I, I grew up in Ohio where they actually have these things. But for those of you who don't have never seen one of these, it's kind of like, wait, wait, wait. You literally drive your car in and you say, uh, let's see, I'll take a, a case of St. Pauli Girl and uh, two bottles of the Chardonnay. Let's just go with the Yellowtail. And they load them into your trunk. You never get out of your car. How crazy is that? But when you see drive-in liquor store, you kind of go, wait a minute. Aren't we not supposed to have liquor in our cars, or at least not open liquor containers? Yeah, we're not. What do they need to know? What do people genuinely need to know about what you're sharing? If you're trying to sell the notion, hey, I sell Budweiser, okay, fine, that works. And if you're trying to sell the notion, hey, you don't have to get out of your car, that works. But when you see drive-in Budweiser, it's kind of like, wow, I'm not sure if that's going to encourage the appropriate action. I'm not sure that everybody's going to be on board for this. By the way, uh, I know Susan said, you know, drop your questions into the chat and we'll deal with them at the end. If you have any questions as I'm rambling along, don't hesitate to go ahead and put it in there now because I love going off on tangents. I genuinely do. People need to know what their role is in the whole conversation. And people need to know that when you're done with the conversation, you have not changed their world so much, you're taking away their hope. Project management is all about change. It is nothing but change. People need to understand, hey, yeah, your world is going to change. But God willing, it's for the better. It's going to improve. And here's where I need your help, or here's where I really can't afford your intervention. We need to make sure we have a common understanding as to what's going on with that and just exactly where it's taking us. We need to have that together. We need to be able to share that information appropriately. So the messaging pointers, the inverted pyramid, start with the headline. Get that out of the way. Don't waste any time. Here we are. This is what we're here for. And I need to tell you this. Dr. Hut Hut, I'm sure, didn't want to say you have incurable cancer. I'm, I'm sure that was not part of the message the man wanted to share. But what they need to know. Yeah, the other stakeholders, you need to make sure that you're thinking about, okay, when you're sharing the message, you're, you're the primary sender in this communications model, but what, what you need to tell them, tell them and explain to them, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. This is what I needed to get across to you. From here on out, you also should be aware of, and that's what they need to know, the environment, the culture, it's funny, I, um, I lived in Frederick, Maryland, which is uh, for all intents and purposes, and I know this is not a popular word necessarily, but I'll use it anyhow. There, it's kind of a woke community. Yeah, it's a very civically active community. And I moved from there out to far Western Maryland. I now live in the boondocks. I live in the mountains. As a matter of fact, I live on top of Haystack Mountain. 
Yeah, the boondocks. People come out here and they're like, "No, not quite Deep Creek, Brenda." Yeah, it's 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 pretty close, but uh, yeah, we're about a half hour this side of Deep Creek. So, and by this side, I mean the DC side, but uh, not far. Yeah, it's beautiful country. It really is, but it's interesting because it's a different culture. It's a different culture. Out here, there are different ways that they filter information. And you need to know your stakeholders well enough to know what you need to tell them might be universal. What they need to know might differ depending upon whether they're at Deep Creek or whether they're in D.C. It's going to make a whole boatload of, of difference. So when you're sharing the message, you need to make sure you get those three across, and some people will elaborate. My old boss, Ed, was great about this because he called me into his office, and we were supposed to have a meeting, and I had put together a PowerPoint and everything else. I was ready to go. And Ed said, so, Carl, why are we here? And I said, well, I said, let me bring up my PowerPoint, and I'm flipping my laptop around, and I said, here's what I'd like to cover today. And Ed said, no, 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 no. Why are we here? And I said, well, I wanted to go through the AT&T contract and explain to you exactly what, and he said, Carl, why are we here? And I said, we're here so that you'll give me another $200,000 to work on the AT&T contract. And he looked at me and he said, am I gonna get my money back? And I said, yeah, I said, the AT&T contract's huge. It's our biggest contract right now. And he said, okay, then we're done. If I had started with, I need 200 grand for the AT&T contract, that would have been inverted pyramid. That would have been, and notice what happened. My, I had allotted 25 minutes for my meeting with Ed. It wound up taking about five and it was over. And I got the outcome I wanted and got the outcome he wanted. Everybody walked away happy, anything else, would have been wasted energy. And you've seen this. You've been in too many just one-on-ones where you're they're trying to explain to you how, how, how something was built or how it was cooked. And it's like, no, I just want to eat it. They don't get the point. We're the ones who should have those messaging pointers. You want to kill a message? Obfuscate. Yeah. Obfuscate. I've been accused of grandiloquence on occasion. My own sons have accused me of grandiloquence. Oh, that's using big words when little words will do. Yeah, using big words when little words will do. A lot of times, and I'll say to them, son, son, you don't understand. The big word is the perfect word. Dad, you're going to get, you know, I'm surprised you didn't get beat up on the playground for that. And you know, well, I and then I say, well, I did. You know, <laughs> that's beside the point. Uh, we don't hide behind words. We can't, and we shouldn't. We should try and make our messages clear and simple, and something that people can look at and say, value add. Every single time you open your mouth, people are going to feel like, oh, wow, I got something out of that. There was something I could use. There was something meaningful in there. The worst thing you could possibly say? Look, I know this isn't going to matter to you, but... <laughs> Not a good road to go down. No, that is a terrible road to go down because you're killing the message. You don't want to kill your message. You want to let people know there is a reason. There is hope. There is something good at the end of this message. No matter how dark the message might be, there's always something you can point to and say, if you didn't have that information, you would be less better off. You need the data. You need that information. And you need it, well, pretty strong. This is the whole idea of obfuscation. I like George Eliot's quote and Winston Churchill's, but Tom Lehrer, some of you actually know who Tom Lehrer is. He was a uh, 
a Harvard professor for mathematics until he got fired. He actually got fired from Harvard for singing in class. Yeah. Yeah, he, he put out several albums in the 60s and 70s. And the albums are all comedy albums. And he had a song and he was leading into it and he was getting setting it up. And he said, uh, he said in the, uh, he said, it's not unlike the story of the, uh, of the necrophiliac who found his life's dream when he became owner of a mortuary. And it was like, and half the audience cracked up, half the audience is sitting there looking stunned. And that's when he said, the rest of you can look it up when you go home. So true. So true. When, if you've got something and sending people flying for the dictionary, you failed. We don't obfuscate. We really don't want to. And I want to talk about a word you want to avoid. You. You. Anytime you say you, be very, very careful. Not You can't eliminate it from your speaking. You just can't. When you're talking to somebody, eventually you're going to say you. When you're sending an email, eventually you're going to say you. When you're writing a document, eventually you're going to say you. But beware, because it's a finger point. It is. It's genuinely a finger point. You. Wow. You. Try, and, and next time you're writing an email, this is a homework assignment. You actually have homework after we're done here. What I'd like you to do is, in your next email, I want you to write it. And when you're proofing it, and some of you are like, proofreading an email? Never, never happens. Well, it's time. Try proofing one email, just one, and read through it. And every time you see the word you, say it a little louder than any other word in the, in the sentence. So I need you to pay attention. Oh, let's do that again. I need you to pay attention to the third paragraph and the fourth paragraph, because what we're trying to get across as soon as you say that, it's, hey, you. It's a dangerous word. It really is. People feel like they are being put on the spot every time you say you. You have the power. Yeah. Oh, really? Just because you say it doesn't make it so. Now, you have the ability to, you have the capacity to. Yeah, 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 you do. But. The door is open for anyone who wants to, oh, that's a different way of saying you have the power to. The nice thing about saying it that way is people can infuse themselves into the situation if they so desire. Just stripping out the word you gives them power. It does. It empowers them. It really does because they're like, hey, I'm anybody. I could be that anybody. I could do this and it's a triumph. If you strip out the word you to the degree practicable, you're never going to get rid of all of them, but strip out the word you to the degree practicable, what you're actually doing is empowering people when you're talking and when you're sending out email. When you're sending those messages, this is a quick, simple improvement that you can make in very, very short order. Also, be careful about ascribing people to a situation. Look, you're in a situation right now where your 401k is trashed. Okay, fine and dandy. But somebody might say, well, I'm, my 401k is not doing well. I wouldn't color it trashed. Don't ascribe characteristics. Don't ascribe feelings to these people because they may not have them. But Many people are in a situation right now where their 401k is being trashed. That way, mentally, at least, they can go, yeah, that would be me. Yeah. They can raise their hand. They can express themselves as being part of that cadre, part of that group. 
we need to be the ones who are very cautious about deploying the word you. Because it's a word that they can use to empower themselves or we can use in a way that comes across as slightly accusatory. We want the former rather than the latter. Oh. Do you remember the inverted pyramid? Now, the reason I ask this, that was what, half a dozen slides ago? Half a dozen slides ago. And a lot of times in a presentation, you know, we're sitting around going, oh, geez, it's a virtual thing. Squirrel. Yeah. And a variety of different things distract us from the message. If you remember what the inverted pyramid was, is congratulations. You're paying attention. And part of the reason you're paying attention is because it's a cornerstone of one whole profession. It's a cornerstone of one whole profession that many of us never get to uh, get to explore, use, understand. It's its own universe. Wow. So keep in mind that if you can validate that people are getting your message, you're doing well in terms of your messaging. Five words to check and double check. You, we already talked about that. Also, I and me. There are, are certain politicians who shall remain nameless that have just, they need an eye exam. They really do. They have this nasty habit of me, 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 me. They, they, they focus on themselves. Now, I, what's interesting is right now, some of you are putting particular politicians in your head. When I was putting together the slide deck, I wasn't thinking about any national politician. I was actually thinking about one guy locally who has just been, holy smokes, just me, 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 I, 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 I. Just can't get off that. If, if you've got something about yourself that you want to tout, find someone else to tout it for you. Yeah, you want to avoid being the one who's constantly saying, uh, Carl, excuse me, I, I've known you for quite a few years and you're basically an egomaniac to begin with. Well, yeah, there's that. But it is one of those things to kind of tamp down, to keep in check. Catholic. Now, do you know what Catholic even means? You'll notice the lowercase, and I, I had to actually fix it in PowerPoint to get it to stay lowercase. Catholic. Now, some of you immediately are thinking about the Pope, you're thinking about the Vatican, you're thinking about the Holy Catholic Church. Catholic. The word Catholic is actually a word in the English language, lowercase c. Catholic. It means universal. Yeah. The Catholic Church supposedly was the universal church. Oh, and that's why they called it the Catholic Church. Who knew? But I had to explain that to you. Anytime you've got to explain how you're using a word, pick a different word. Really. I mean, it's kind of cool knowing that that's what Catholic means. It's, it's fun. I love etymology. I've got a whole shelf of books on etymology and the origins of phrases. But if you have to explain how you're using a word, and the word is something that's in the common vocabulary, like Catholic, you've got a problem. Find a different word, like universal. People understand universal unless they're thinking universal studios. but that notwithstanding, Catholic, it means universal. And if you're ever going to use it for that purpose, just a heads up, most people are not going to understand. Double check your use of the word we. God bless the Queen. Yeah, Queen Elizabeth, most of you were wrapped up in her 
funeral over the past few days. Yeah. Queen Elizabeth. We are not amused. No. It's not the royal we for most of us. And yet we have a nasty habit up there. Just did it. We have a nasty habit of using the word we to be inclusive. And that's fine. But check yourself. When you're saying we, are you really talking about you and them? Are you? Because if that's your intent, you're in good shape. But if it's being used just for the sake of, well, rather than saying you, I'll say we. Try and find a different way to phrase it out. Always try and find a way to phrase it, rephrase it. Oh, no. I've just fallen into my own trap. Always. Never. Very few, few things in this universe are always or never. I'm the risk guy. Always. Never. And I, I love this. I actually I was taken off a T-shirt while I was uh, working on this presentation. And I, I looked at the tag, which was well-worn from dozens of machine washings. Take a look at that. Hand wash only. That's almost as bad as always and never. Hand wash only. Oh, perfect. And Jackie just, just made a great point. She said, uh, she said, IT folks tend to use IT phrases that don't make any sense to the customers, the users, because they'll start talking about the network and, you know, the, the client server and the fact, you know, we use blade servers and, and somebody's going to be sitting there going, Slack jawed, wondering, I have no idea what the devil they're talking about, but I'm not going to drag this meeting out any longer than it has to be. So by golly, Ned, I'll cut it short. I'll make sure. Yeah, that's a really good point. So check your use of lingo. Check your use of jargon. There's jargon in every profession. And there's jargon in your local community. Just moving out to Western Maryland from Central Maryland has been kind of a reality check in terms of how just basic things are perceived. Be careful and watch the things you're declaring as always or never. Hand wash only. Yeah, I didn't see that till long after it had gone through the wash any number of times. You know what? That t-shirt is holding up just fine. Thank you very much. Tomorrow. You can change all this tomorrow. Manana. Oh, Carl, what's what's manana? What's that little thing over the end? Oh. Now, if any of you took high school Spanish, you know what manana is. If you've listened to music out of the early 60s, manana. Yeah, but most of you know what manana is. It's a point at which it's safe to use a foreign phrase. Manana, tomorrow. And there are a lot of things that you can change between now and tomorrow to actually just completely radically improve your messaging. You want to improve your messaging? My son, Adam, the paleontologist, he's the one who does voicemail perfectly. Better than his dad, better than anybody else I know. In order to get a voicemail from my son, I'll get the phone call or my phone will ring and I won't answer it. I'm busy. And I'll notice that he called and just hung up. About three to four minutes later, he'll call again, and I'll, he'll let it roll over to voicemail. And then on the voicemail, he'll share the message that he spent three or four minutes writing in preparation to leave a voicemail. Adam never leaves a stupid voicemail. We've all gotten that voicemail. Hey, yeah, I, uh, wow, I was really hoping you'd pick up, but you didn't pick up. And, uh, you know, the, uh, if I, if I could have, I'd really be rather telling you this in person. But, y you know, Todd, yeah, Todd that's on our team. And, oh, wait, wait, 
Your phone's telling me I've only got 15 seconds left. I'll tell you what, I'll call you back and finish this on a second voicemail. Boom. Yeah, that's enough to make you crazy. My son will never leave you a voicemail that's longer than 30 seconds. Because that's all he's got time to write. And the beauty of it is, it's succinct. It's direct. It says exactly what he wanted to say. And it's crystal clear. Wow. Good job, Ace. Yeah. I'm very proud of that young man. Because I never taught him that. But he was the one who said, I hate leaving voicemail. And I said, then send email. And he said, no, I've got to find a way to leave voicemail. And that was his solution. Good solution, young man. Well done. And any of you would be happy to get an email, a voicemail from my son. Bluff, you can do that tomorrow. Bottom line up front. Share the beginning of your message and work from the inverted pyramid. Get the headline out there. Tell them why they should communicate with you. Don't drag it out. Don't make it something just long, worn out, and tedious. No. Bottom line, up front. A day without you. You know, some of us feel compelled with certain people to send them email or texts every day. Take a day off from your voicemail. Take a day off from your email. Now, I can't because I always promise people 24 hours I'll get back to you. But in terms of if there are people you ritually send an email to, unless it's required by the contract, quite frankly, don't just ping them to say, hey, everything okay? Let it go. Two guys I've worked with for, jeez, uh, 20 years plus, off and on, and not like we do work together. We do work in the same places. And are Randy England and Alfonso Bucero. And it's kind of intriguing because I've seen them present a number of times. And their presentation, when they begin sharing information, they always start it the exact same way. Anybody who's ever seen them present knows what's coming. There's no surprise whatsoever because it starts with Randy going, today is a great day. And Alfonso always echoes, tomorrow, even better. They do that all the time. And, you know, you might think, wow, and you just said a day without you. I, I think that would get old real fast. It doesn't. Why? Because no matter what message they're sharing, no matter how dark, no matter how consequential, they're saying today is a great day. Now, I'm assuming that everybody on the call woke up breathing this morning. I think that's a fair bet. Yeah, that makes today a great day. It really does. Today is a great day. Tomorrow, even better. If we start our messaging with that kind of consistent ray of hope, the rest of it is tempered. The rest of it is actually tempered by that. People who are around you will start to realize you have positive intent. Assuming positive intent is something people don't do well, particularly not in today's culture. They don't assume that every message being shared is for your best interests. Assuming positive intent, however, is a wonderful way to empower your messages, to actually open doors. When you assume positive intent, when you assume today is a great day, tomorrow even better, that's sending a message that no matter how much our jobs are getting us down, no matter how much we're being pushed into corners, doesn't matter. Today is still a great day. Join me. You were breathing this morning. That's right. And remember to only share what's needed to be shared. Not what you feel like saying. There are plenty of people who start sharing messages and they share what they want to say. You know, telling others what you really think means sharing the needed message not the wanted message. You might think, 
and he's a moron. You know, that's not something they need to hear. No. What you want to say is, I need this person to sign this document. I need this person to participate in this particular fashion. It's what you need. That's where the line is drawn between what you say and what you need to say. It's an important line that gets drawn. We're the ones who ultimately need to draw that line. We're the ones who have the opportunity to say, what you need to know is this is the concern that we're going to mutually resolve. Oh. And don't take yourself out of the equation, because if you're the messenger, people still do want to shoot the messenger. It's up to you to make sure that as the messenger, you're spreading this message positively. You're opening the doors in a way that other people can tolerate the message. You are saying to people, hey, just so you know, today's a great day. You get a voicemail from my son, and you know it's going to be less than 30 seconds. Wow. How fun is that? And you know it's going to have all the germane information. And you know he's not going to waste your time. If you listen to it twice, you'll be the richer for it, not the lesser. And that puts us in a really, really good place. That said, according to Verizon, it is 1145 Eastern. So let me uh, take pause, if I might, and give you a chance to actually drop some questions in the chat. Oh, people who undermine what you... Oh, uh, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Karen's. Uh, <laughs> When dealing with these people who are trying to undermine what you're saying, tips on bluff, circle back, circle back to the bluff, circle back to the headline in the inverted pyramid, circle back to the beginning and say, our goal here today is by the time we're done, we'll. That's where I'm going with this. Um, and if you want to go someplace else, oh, pop shot. Um, don't call them that, by the way. Um, but if you want to go someplace else, oh, person, I, I recognize and respect that. But I'll tell you what, you and I should take this offline later. For now, here's where we're going and I need to get us there. It's, it's a very nice way of saying, be quiet. I order you to be quiet. Yeah, because if they are the people who are genuinely out to just undermine you, in the course of the message, they will they will do their darndest to keep at it. They really will. They'll just push hard. And you can only stop that if and when you actually uh, kind of raise that specter and say, you know, I will, uh, I'll be happy to take that, take that with you offline. For now, here's where I'm going, back to the top of the inverted pyramid. Uh, we did have a, a comment. I think it was posted pretty much in the beginning of the presentation. It says, uh, Carl may cover this topic, but when we talk about stakeholders, this includes, and I assume, our boss. What I really think may be very opposed to what he actually thinks. I assume this is still encouraged with the thought that he is still the boss. Oh, absolutely. When I got hired by Ed, I always made reference back because he was the best boss I ever had. Ed, when he hired me, he said, Carl, I want you to know I run this business as a dictatorship. He said, I'm a benevolent dictator, but I'm the guy in charge. It's my money on the line. I'm the one who's going to be running the show. I need you to understand that. And I need to understand that you understand that. And I said, yes, sir. I got that. You're paying the bills. And he said, good, as long as we understand that. And there are times I would actually bring that back up to him. I would say, Ed, what I'm going to share is not something that you have in the past been anxious to hear. But, and then I would go ahead and share it. And as far as it goes, they need to know what you really think. Strip the emotion out of it. 
And at one point I had uh, one guy in the office refer to me and he said, Carl, you're a hothead. And I said, wow, thank you so much. I prefer to think of it as Carl, you're passionate. It's all in how you frame things. It really is. And I think it's up to us to make sure we're doing the framing well. Carl, we thank you so much for presenting with us today. Thank you.